How's it going YouTube? Joe Totino here, back with another trailer music tutorial. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Uh, I've been busy working on some incredible projects, making some awesome music, but I'm back and I wanna bring you guys some more uh, awesome free tutorials to uh, help in your music making endeavors. I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for their amazingly positive feedback on my last few videos. Over the last year or so, I've gotten to connect with dozens of composers and musicians from around the world. So thank you everybody for supporting the channel. And again, more free content to come your way very soon. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at another epic orchestral trailer track called The Road Ahead. Uh, this track was published with the amazing Brass Tracks music, and I'll post a link to the original song in the description if you're interested in taking a look. So let's go ahead and jump into my logic session. We're gonna take a look at the composition itself break down which sample libraries and instruments I used, uh, and some of the techniques and plugins I used to mix it down. Let's jump into Logic. So here we are in the original Logic session. You can see that this is all mapped out in my trailer template. Uh, more than happy to do a walkthrough of how I built my template in a separate video. Uh, I like to work with a fairly large size template. Uh, so let's take a listen to the track as a whole. Uh, and then we'll start breaking down the different elements and talking about the sample libraries I used to compose it. Cool, so that was my track, The Road Ahead, again, published with uh, Brass Tracks Music. So let's dive into the actual session and take a listen to some of the instruments I used to compose it. Uh, I don't believe this was the full mixed version. I think I had a separate session where I did a little bit further mixing on it. Uh, but in any case, I figured it'd be more helpful to have access to all the MIDI instruments to be able to look at the composition. So this track, like most, started out as a really simple idea. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something similar to some of the other work that I did, piano, strings, and percussion driven with big French horn melodies and leads. Um, and this one started with this really simple piano motif in A. And that was me just kind of sitting at the piano and messing around until I came up with something that I liked. And I think the reason I gravitated towards this really, really simple idea was it was open enough for me to be able to fit chords under. So I didn't want the idea to be too complex because the more complex the melody is, the more complex um, the harmony you make, the harder it is to kind of fit different elements, weave different elements in and out. So simplicity is your friend. Uh, and in this case, it worked well because I was able to fit these really moody chord progressions under. playing in octaves here. 
You can see I've got some sustain. And then it repeats. Um, so that was my idea. That was the, the, the premise I had for the track. And I think that was strong enough for me to be able to build everything else off of that. And then the second thing I actually looked for and added was some sort of signature sound, something that was going to differentiate this track from others. And I had had a sound that I saved uh, that I just happened to stumble upon one day. Uh, and it was a sound from Native Instruments' uh, Rise and Hit. And it's a sound that sounds like this. But I thought it could be really cool and interesting if I just use a little snippet of the riser as kind of like a little signature sound to add a little bit of ear candy to the intro here so it wasn't just an isolated piano and strings. So the way my composition started was it was really that signature sound there and my piano. And I was almost using this as kind of a whoosh, a transitionary sound to take me into the downbeat of certain moments where I was going to be introducing new ideas. So for example, the, the next element that comes in uh, are the low strings, which are supporting uh, the chords. So I'm bringing in the chords on the piano and then using my, my low, long strings to re-emphasize the chords, add a different timbre to the mix as a whole. From an intro perspective, I didn't feel like that was enough. So what I decided to do was use some string harmonics uh, to kind of introduce a little bit of some high frequency content. Uh, and this is a really, really simple technique that you can use um, on any type of, I mean, I hear it all the time in film score and cinematic music and trailer music to just kind of set the tone. When you've got a really simple idea brewing, you can add one of these sustained string elements to just add a little bit more tension and drama to everything. So just this really simple idea on A, it'll move up to kind of create a little bit of a melody as it progresses, but you know, the first eight bars or so are really just sitting on A, doing a little bit of some mod wheel automation to control the dynamics. Uh, otherwise, those three elements, the string sustains, um, the piano, and my signature sounds with a couple of synths layered that I've got at the bottom here, just a couple of Omnisphere pads. These two here. That to me was kind of my bed. That was enough support where I could put melodies and chords and stuff on top of that and didn't have to worry about things clashing. Starting to bring in some low booms, some sound effects as a sync point uh, as soon as I bring in uh, the chord progression. So if we take a listen to the top. And I've got these amazing low booms from Gravity which almost never need any external processing. They just work so well. Um, and that kind of supplied me with enough of a sync point of a hit point to start bringing in some chords on my strings as well. Back up a little bit. So for strings, uh, as per usual, I'm using primarily Cinematic Studio strings. Uh, especially for the longs, the, they're so expressive. They've got such a warm character and tone to them. Um, and I love playing the basses and the celli in octaves to add a little bit more weight to the bottom end. Um, but the celli add just enough harmonics to the high frequencies where you can hear them clearly in a mix. Uh, and these low, long strings with the piano are really all you need for this intro section. You know, a couple hits for some sync points. And so again, less is more, not overloading it with too many ideas. Intro and trailer tracks are really about setting the mood, setting the tone. Um, you can make it big and epic in the, the back end, on the, the, you know, the, the tail end of the second act and the third act. But for my intro, I wanted to keep it kind of empty, uh, so I had a lot of room to build from. 
instrument wise um i don't think i mentioned i'm using the giant from native instruments as my main piano i love this piano um i'm still using it you know years later uh, i love that the tone knob can really transform the sound quite a bit um i've been finding other pianos for different styles of music work great but for this epic cinematic style the the giant just works so well and i've got this xxl button pressed doing a little bit of some subtractive eq to get rid of some unnecessary low end and cutting out some mud and then just a hair of compression um maybe more than a hair a long hair of compression uh, and then brightening it with a couple of uh different eqs from the uh the slate bundle and then I've got a couple of different time-based effects. I'm using the Verb Suite uh, on the Amsterdam Hall setting. This is from the Bercasti, um, the Bercasti impulses here, which sound amazing. Um, Amsterdam Hall. And I, I love this unit because I find I use this decay knob more lately than I've ever have been. Um, it's great to where if I really like the tonality of the reverb, but I just want it to be a hair longer, I can kind of alter the decay time. Uh, in this case, I wanted to leave it a little bit more natural the way it was sampled, the way it was recorded, so I left it at 100%. But then I've also got a plate reverb loaded here, uh, and I'm also doing a little bit of chorus to add some widening to the, the piano as a whole. For my strings, I mentioned I'm using Cinematic Studio strings, uh, and then a couple of Omnisphere patches here for some low pads, and you can see I also use Omnisphere for some bass pulses and some sub bass as we move through the track. So let's take a listen to the intro and then we'll talk a little bit more about this hit point here and bringing in some new instruments. Cool, so bar 13 is where things start to pick up. I knew that this is where I wanted to start to introduce more percussive, more sound effect driven sounds. Um, so this was a big sync point for me. It's where I start to introduce some of the bigger whoosh bang hits um, that I'm really using for the rest of the track. And it's also where the short strings start to form a little bit of a rhythm, um, kind of intensifying the second half of the first act. Uh, to add a little bit of, of you know, tensing and suspension uh, until a break. And when I get into my second act, I'll start to develop a new idea with the short strings being the, the primary focus. Uh, so here are my short strings. Uh, again, cinematic studio strings. I've got violas, violins, cellos, and basses playing this. Pretty simple. So playing lots of octaves, kind of filling the frequency range here, um, taking advantage of the natural range of the, the various string instruments. So my basses are probably playing the simplest part. And you can hear I'm doing some volume automation here just to drive the sound up. For this track, I wanted to be semi-realistic, so I don't have a second violin section because the second violins are playing the long harmonics, though I am cheating a little bit, and I've got cello legatos at the same time as the shorts, but... Again, it's trailer music, go big or go home. Um, and then this is also, as I said, where I'm starting to introduce some percussion. So big percussion section in this track, I'm using some usual suspects. Um, I wrote this track before Damage 2 came out, so I'm using a lot of the original Damage 1 elements. And I'm actually using a loop. Um, if we take a listen to this Damage loop,
This was probably the last percussion element that I added. I try and stay away from using damage loops, but in my opinion, it's all about how you use them. Uh, I don't think the percussion section sounds like it's looped, and I'm certainly layering it with plenty of other sounds. Uh, so the loop is more of a supporting element than it is something that's at the forefront. Um, I'm also using the Damage Armageddon Ensemble, which the Damage 2 ones sound fantastic, but these are also excellent. And then I wanted an even bigger sound, so I went over to 8DO, and I'm using a ton of stuff from 8DO. I'm using the Tycho's. And then I'm also using a kick drum from one of the hybrid tools. And this is what's giving me my punch. So this is one of the things I've, I've really experimented with and found really cool results is using kick drums and kind of standard drum kit elements layered with my bigger orchestral sounds just to add a little bit more punch, a little bit more attack. So in total, the percussion sounds like this. It's really simple in this section. And then I've also got some Strike Force layered on there as well. Uh, I love Strike Force. I think this is such an amazing library. It blends so well with Damage and a lot of the other libraries I've got. Um, so I try to use these when I can as well. They add a cool kind of hybrid, almost a metallic sound. You can see I've got a little bit of some metal double bass kick drum influence in there. I'm doing some really quick rolls. I'm a drummer and hard rock metal, that's my jam. So I always try to bring some of those influences into my trailer tracks. Um, so yeah, percussion and strings alone are, are kind of driving the rhythmic section in this act. Um, so let's just go ahead and solo those. So I've got my epic percussion bus and my string bus. And then sound effects wise, I'm also starting to introduce some new ideas. So I've got a bunch of different hits. I've got some hits from Damage. Uh, yeah, these guys here. I've got, again, the subs from Gravity. I've got a riser starting from Gravity. I've got some Ava Instinct. And then I've got another hit uh, element down here. And that creates a really big full sound. Uh, and then another thing I'm doing at this bar 13 is I took that Native Instruments rise and hit patch, that kind of signature sound that I found, and I'm actually extending the length of it here so that the sound actually rises and hits and plays in the way that the instrument intended for you to play it. Um, so I'm using... So also using it as a transitional element and then switching back and just using the rise element and then switching to transition. So it's a sound that kind of carries the track along, um, but it's something that's familiar because I'm introducing it from the very start. So here's what that bar 13 sync point sounds like. Let me back up so you can hear this rise and hit. And then last but certainly not least, uh, I'm starting to introduce some brass elements here. Um, I went kind of crazy with the brass on this one where I'm doing lots and lots of layering. So I've got, you know, Cinebrass, I'm using the two horn ensemble, the six horn ensemble, and the 12 horn ensemble. But they're all playing slightly different things. I love how these layer together. Uh, and then I'm also using a bit of trailer brass, uh, the Horde. Uh, and the Metropolis Arc 1 trombones, which sound great. So my brass tend to be more supporting, um, aside from French horns, which usually carry the melody. Uh, so I'm probably outlining the chords.
This 12 horns ensemble is truth be told the reason I bought Cinebrass to begin with. Uh, I love all the other sounds now that I've got access to it, but this 12 horn ensemble just plays so well. It's got such a, a wide range and it can do everything from very mellow to really kind of biting and aggressing sounds. Um, I am doing on almost all my orchestral instruments, uh, I am using the direction mixer to kind of position stuff in the right space. Um, I know you can do a lot of that stuff on the Logic's panner, but I like to have a separate plugin. Gives me a little bit more control. I like to use the spread knob to bring down the width of the track sometimes. Um, I just find it a lot easier. And then I am cutting out a bit of low end on this just to get rid of some of the rumble. I love these samples, they are a hair noisy, um, so I find cutting out some low frequencies helps a lot of times. Uh, a little bit of OTT, um, I, I'm trying to be as minimal with my OTT as I, can, as I can be, but it's still definitely necessary to add a bit of bite to things. Uh, and then I am using uh, a UAD, Universal Audio API, to crank up quite a bit of the top end. Um, you can see I'm boosting, you know, a 7K here by nearly, what is that, 6 dB? Um, and that is adding quite a bit of bite. Without this plugin, So it gives me a lot of that top end that on its own might not seem like a big difference, but in context of the mix did help the French horns kind of cut through. And because they were the melody, I wanted to make sure that they were clear. I guess I should mention that while I am in A minor, uh, I've decided to go with a bit of a harmonic minor sound where I'm doing this kind of, you know, so my scale actually becomes And you'll hear that becomes a big part of the horn melody in the third act uh, to create, again, a little bit more of a dark, menacing sound. Um, but yeah, this section in total sounds like this. Cool, so transitioning into this first break here. This is the start of my act two, and this is where I introduce the rhythm and the pattern that I'm basically gonna be using for the rest of the cue. Um, I decided to go with a slightly different short string pattern than I did uh, in the first act, just to create a little bit of variety but it's still the same chords. So I'm kind of handing the chords from the piano off to the, the chords in the, the short strings. So here are my short strings. So again, that's all cinematic studio strings. I'm doing quite a bit of, of processing on each individual string as a whole. Uh, especially like the violins are getting a bit of brightening. Uh, I love this air EQ from sl from the Slate Bundle. Um, it adds a really nice like presence and lift and, and air, uh, but brightness especially to high string elements like this that I want to cut through the mix just a little bit more. Um, and then just to get some more low end, I'm layering the bass parts here with the short string spiccatos in arc. which just have such a full sound. So these are really, really meaty. So I, I love the way those sound and the strings just don't quite sound as girthy without them. If I mute them. It adds such an amazing sound. Uh, and then on top of the strings, uh, I'm doing a couple of new synth additions just to add, again, an extended low end to keep with the semi-hybrid sound. Uh, I'm starting to add some sub bass. Just really simple. Just playing the chords. And then a pulse.
for a track like this that's pretty orchestrally uh, orchestrally driven um orchestrally orchestrally driven um i try to work out my orchestra parts and then find synth parts that layer and blend well with the orchestra uh, and i just found these two omnisphere patches work well so the synths and the strings uh, are doing most of the motor work <laughs> And you can hear that those synths are adding quite a bit to the, the sub-frequency, adding a lot of weight to the parts. Uh, all the same sound effects generally as the previous version, uh, just adding more, so just more hits. Um, and then certainly the percussion is getting beefed up in this part as well. Um, I'm starting to add more patches from Strike Force. Uh, so if we take a listen to my percussion section, this is what it's doing. So I'm really starting to build out my percussion section here. Uh, and the biggest tip I have about percussion is making sure you're filling the frequency range. Um, the frequency range that you're aiming to fill with the percussion. I usually go for a pretty full range with my percussion. I've, I've got everything from really low drum hits to, as you can hear, really high cymbals. Uh, and you wouldn't think that something as simple as a cymbal will change the entire sound of your percussion, but in the mix, a lot of times our ears will, you know, grab onto one element, usually a higher frequency element. And so those symbols can be the difference between your percussion really cutting through and your percussion sounding really muddy and falling under uh, some of the synths or strings or other tonal elements. So if you take a listen, this section here with the symbols. I'll take them out. these downbeats here lose a lot of energy when I take those cymbals out. So never be afraid of cymbals. In this case, I'm using cymbals from Majestica, um, but lately I've been using a lot of the damage cymbals. I love how they have the one bar mapping so I can do really easy kind of crescendos into bars, but. works really well. So again, my percussions are primarily composed of some damage hits, which these are just my Armageddon ensembles. I'm doing a little bit of post-processing to them. And on the bus, um, because I am starting to add some more damage elements as we move forward, uh, on the damage bus, I'm actually doing a little bit of this trans X um, transient, you know, multi-band transient designer from Waves, uh, which I love to add a bit of extra kind of top end bite and attack. Uh, I think I even tweaked a preset called More Punch, uh, and that just, again, helped my percussion kind of cut through the mix. Um, layered on top of damage, I've got my cymbals, some epic tycos, those kick drums from earlier, and then a bunch of strike force patches. And I think that's it for percussion. So, one of the things that I always try to do is fill my mix with some sort of sound going on. So you'll see I'm starting a bunch of risers, uh, even at the beginning of a section, that'll last for the entirety of an act. So this riser here is starting down really low and it'll end here at bar 31. Uh, and then you can see here, I'm also continuing to introduce that native instruments. Uh, I am doing a couple of other kind of riser additions in here. So I ditched the six horn ensemble for this section and instead I'm using just the two horn ensemble but I'm adding an extra voice. Um, so technically it's two times three, 
Um, and the way I'm doing this is the Cinebrass uh, has polyphonic legato, um, which I find helpful for some things and not so helpful for other things. In this case, it helped in just giving me a bit of, um, you know, an option here to voice some chords. And then here comes my, you know, melody. I, I didn't want this section here to resolve. I wanted to end on high tension because the idea is this is where the intensity is really gonna start to pick up in the trailer. So it should really start to pick up in the music. Uh, so at this point, I've got a, a great sync point here. I'm using an amazing downer sound. Let's see, where are my downers? Here's the downer here. This one is from Quantum, which Quantum is one of my absolute favorite. You know, Quanta, Ava Instinct, uh, these are some of the libraries I just love using for drag and drop sound effects that I can really easily manipulate. Uh, and then as that downer sound plays out, I'm also introducing a riser. One of the big light bulb moments for me when I was learning about trailer music production um, was listening to these kind of stuttery rising sound effects and wondering, how the hell do people make this stuff? Uh, until I realized it's really as simple as taking a sound you like and automating some sort of tremolo effect on it. Um, you can use Logic's own, you can use a number of different plugins. I love to use Tremolator, it's what I've been using for years. Um, and in this case, the sound without Tremolator. Still a great sounding riser, but I wanted to add a little bit more rhythm to it. So adding this tremolator on and setting it to a 16th note rhythm. And then my third act is where I'm really starting to introduce my melody. So again, melody being played on the French horns. Um, while I was writing this track, I had the idea for this melody in my head. That dissonance right there is what I was looking for. So actually was also layering it in the strings uh, just to add again a bit more high end. So if I go down to my um, strings here, I'm using the arc uh, high strings. These guys here. And then I'm also starting to bring in some choirs here. Um, got some short choirs playing al along with the um, the violin sections, the, the string section. These are my long choirs. And then the shorts are here. For these choirs, I'm using arc uh, one and arc two to get the bass choir in there, which these sound so great. They just have such a cool. And then I can only assume that these are Oceana. which just works so well. They, 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 they blend and layer so well with everything else in the mix. Uh, Choir-wise, especially for these shorts, uh, I'm doing a bit more post-processing uh, than I normally would, kind of brightening them up uh, and using the fab filter to hit it with a compressor. I've even got the vocal setting on here. Hey, 
I try not to rely on choir too much. From my experience, it seems like most libraries are wanting no choir versions. Uh, so if you rely too heavily on the choir and then take them out and your track sounds really empty, it could be problematic. So uh, again, just trying to use like the synths, choir elements as more of a supporting role as opposed to relying too heavily on them. Speaking of which, uh, for the synths here, uh, we've got a lot of the same sounds that we had in Act 2, but I am adding an additional sound here, which I believe is layering with the horn melody. This is one of those sounds that I hope you don't hear in the mix, but hopefully I, I hope you hear the idea of it in the mix, where my goal is just to give the lead melody, the horn melody, a little bit more width. So in the mix, it doesn't really poke out as a synth sound, but it just adds this extra width to the melody. So hopefully it becomes a little bit more uh, apparent over all the other elements that are going on. Otherwise it's just some really simple bass pulses and subs to get some extra energy. And all of that is bringing us to right here at bar 40, where I've got a whole bunch of risers. And then this sound right here, which is another riser that I'm not actually using at the start. Uh, I'm waiting a bit to start fading it in. And then I'm also doing some automation with the tremolo. So if you take a look at uh, the tremolo, it looks like I'm automating the speed or the, the rate mod of the tremolo. So if we take a look at the plugin, it'll start to come in here. And I'm automating that rate mod there, uh, which is kind of changing the speed to make it a little bit faster to grow in intensity uh, and kind of transition us into uh, this little alt outro here that I have. I knew I wanted to use this kind of triplet setting here where, you know, this triplet feel where bum, 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 bum. So I kind of took that rhythm and just orchestrated it out on everything. So uh, again, my strings are the primary driving force here. So here's just Cinematic Studio String. <laughs> So I've got some strings that are playing straight, but then I've got other strings that are doing bum, 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 playing that kind of triplet rhythm. But one thing you'll notice is the strings are slowly rising. Uh, so as a way to create a little bit more tension and suspense to the end of the track, uh, I'm actually rising the strings in pitch um, with arc. Cool, and then of course bringing back my horns, uh, and I believe I'm doing some short horn work here. Yeah, I've got these bass bones, which I'm using the the Metropolis Arc One um, bass trombone sustains, but then at the end here I'm bringing in uh, the shorts. Just kind of layering up with all the other elements. Uh, and then the melody is doing something slightly different. And that creates kind of a really full sound. Got some percussion going on. Again, kind of playing along with that triplet rhythm. So just finding the right sounds that layer well with each other. Uh, and then sound effect wise, I'm also doing lots of hits and emphasis to create some you know, good sync points and downbeats.
Some really great sounds here. These Ava Instinct whoosh bangs are just out of this world. Doesn't get much better than that. Um, and they layer so well that even though I hear them all over the place, they still sound so great. It's hard to move away from them. Um, they just layer so well with the orchestra. And then I am adding in these kind of non-organic sounding hits. Let's see, where are these from? These are from uh, Keep Forest Library, one of the Iser X libraries, which I find layer really well with uh, the rest of my percussion. And these are really great to add, again, some extra smack, some extra attack. And that's the track as a whole. So again, starting out as a really simple piano idea uh, and building and progressing from there. Uh, it definitely helps to have a roadmap, to have an idea of the structure you're going for. Uh, I went for a little bit more of a traditional three act structure here, um, you know, where act one's here, act two's here, and then act three here. Um, building in intensity so each act is slightly bigger than the last. Um, but all in all, uh, this was my track, The Road Ahead. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I love doing these tutorials, so as long as I have the time to do them, I'm going to continue bringing you guys some content here. Please like and subscribe, and if you're interested in getting in contact with me, feel free to leave a comment, shoot me an email, friend me on social media, uh, and I'm more than happy to have a conversation about making great trailer music. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your day, and we will speak very soon.